Good morning. As some of you know, uh, I play electric bass. I started playing bass around the year 2000. And I would play, once I taught myself well enough to play along with people, I started playing with John Anderson uh, at church. We were a praise team at the Grand Haven Seventh-day Adventist Church. And um, I would start playing there. Shortly after that, John asked me to run sound for the group One Accord. So I would play bass at church. I would run sound when the One Accord was practicing. And I would watch their bass player, a gentleman by the name of Bill Stockdale. He happens to be our lead guitar player now. Um, but I would watch what he did. He had been playing bass for many years, and I could learn from him. So I did. I, I, see what he was doing, I'd go home and I'd practice these various bass lines and try to improve myself in what I was doing. One of the other things that we would do as uh, members of the Grand Haven Church was we would go out on the waterfront eh, once a month during the summer and Sabbath afternoon we would stand along the boardwalk and play music. It was a lot of fun. Sometimes people would stop and listen. Sometimes people would stop, request songs, sing with us, spend an hour singing music with us. Most people would just walk right on by as if we didn't even exist. But this one day, Bill Stockdale happened to be there and we happened to play this one particular song that I had learned his bass line on. And I did my best to imitate what he did. And it came off pretty good. After the song, Bill walked up to me, put his arm around me, gave me a big hug, and he said, imitation is the best form of flattery. When was the last time that God came up to you, put his arm around you, and said, imitation is the best form of flattery? Or imitation is the best form of praise? I want to talk this morning about worshiping. Now, if you haven't learned yet, and I know some of you haven't, I will ask questions that I do not expect an answer to. Because the answer is something that you need to deal with for yourself. I don't want a public answer to it. <clears throat> this is one of those questions. On any given Sabbath, any given time you have been in church, when you walk out the door, can you say to yourself, I worshiped God today? I have found for myself that a lot of times that I come into a church service, it's either a lot of work or I'm so tired I fall asleep or the pastor saying something that I totally disagree with and I, I in my mind start arguing with him. And I walk out of church realizing that I didn't worship 
at all. What is worship? Now, this is a question that I would like an answer to. For you, what is worship? Praising God, okay? Um, is singing worship? Yeah? Does it make a difference what kind of music is being used? Yeah? So if we had heavy metal going on in here, you wouldn't say you would be worshiping. It'd be a little bit harder for you to worship. Okay. I like that. I like that. Um, you know, it, it, little historical point. You have an organ here. Did you realize that when organs were brought into church, it was a big controversy similar to what we would have if we had a group come in here playing heavy metal music in church? Organs came out of theater settings. They were the devil's instrument. Not anymore. But this is some of the way things change with society changing. Uh, so singing can be worship. Um, what else makes for worship? Prayer? Okay. What about prayer? Lord, please help me win the Mega Millions lottery, right? Is that worship? No? Why not? Okay. And more selfish than, than anything else. Oh, but I'm going to do a lot of good with it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give $100 an offering plate after I win those millions every time I go to... Anyway. What else is worship? Offering? Giving that hundred dollars, right? Okay. I want you to put on your sanctified imagination hats at the moment. Christ has come. If we understand prophecy correctly, we've spent a thousand years with him in heaven. We have now come back to this earth, which is now the earth made new. And we're told that Sabbath to Sabbath, we will gather together to worship. What is that going to look like? Are you still going to have prayer? Hmm? Praises, okay? Prayers of praise. Uh, are you going to be singing? Um, what about offering? What kind of offering are you going to get? Any idea what the currency of heaven might be or currency of the new earth? Say that again. Love and praise, the currency of heaven. I like that. I mean, that might not have been what you intended, but I like that. Um, what about children's story? Hmm? How many children's stories do you think Christ? Gave when he was on this earth. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. What are the children's stories going to be like in heaven? I don't know, but I'm going to be sitting right there with 
<laughs> Children of all ages, right? Let me tell you how I came up with the idea for a duck-billed platypus. Are we going to be hearing sermons? You think so? I think so. Okay. I would actually like to twist that a little bit. I think the sermons that you will be hearing are going to be more of us talking about what Christ has done for us as we learn as we understand, as we look back on our life and start seeing how everything played together. I don't think, and I, I, in my imagination, I don't think you're going to have scripture reading. Now that might shock you, but what is the scripture? It's man's imperfect writing of what God has said. We have the source. Worship is going to look different in heaven. Um... What do you consider to be the reason, the purpose, the reason why you are here in church today? What is church all about? What is worshiping all about today? I will guide your thinking just slightly by saying, shouldn't it be working towards the idea of worship in the new earth? Yes, there are going to be differences because we're not there yet. Prayer right now is much more for us saying, Lord, Help me understand. Guide my direction. Prayer in heaven will be a little more along the lines of, Lord, I'm so glad you did that for me while I was there. Will there also be an, a prayer request in the new earth? Think about that one. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12 if you don't, haven't uh, done that already. Our scripture reading was verses 1 and 2. I want to continue reading on in Romans chapter 12. Starting in verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. 
He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. God is talking about what he has done for the church in this passage. If you turn to other passages, you will find that God has put this together just the way he designed. And he has done this for a specific reason. If you turn over to Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, verses starting in verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why has God given us these gifts? It's to build up us, the church. The gifts are given individually to everyone. They're talked about as gifts of grace. God's grace. So you, having accepted Christ, have been given a gift. One that he expects you to use to help build the church. Now there are a lot of churches in the world. How many churches do you know of in St. Charles itself? Seven? Okay. Now, seven churches in St. Charles. Is God working in each one of those churches? Absolutely. So if God is working in each one of those churches and God has given gifts of grace to the people in each one of those churches, including ours here, there is an interesting action that should be happening. How many of you like jigsaw puzzles? There are a few that tolerate them, it looks like. Um, have you ever seen a jigsaw puzzle that when you get it all put together, the picture is a wonderful picture? But if you look at every little piece, or almost every little piece, it's its own individual picture, quite often of people. If you look at each piece, you have the picture of a person. But once you put all of the pieces together the way they were intended to go, you get a big picture. Now here's the interesting thing. When you come into church, do you realize that you can look at the people in the church and see God? 
And as people in the church look at you collectively with others, they see God. This is an interesting concept, but one that hasn't gone totally unnoticed. Kyle Matthews is a songwriter that I have appreciated several of his songs. <clears throat> he has one that the lyrics go, brought up in the church against your will, forced to sit through sermons and be still, making trouble for the Sunday school teacher, running through the pews, just a child then, you were wide-eyed and confused. Screaming on the bus with all the youth, more concerned with dating than with truth. Too cool to join the choir, too smug to go to school. Church was boring, and scriptures were just rules. Finally off to college for the fall, 50 different lifestyles on one hall. Your professors question everything. Your roommates test your faith. And easy answers seem so out of place. Running from the chapel with your spouse, making monthly payments on the house. You were living for your children, and they up and moved away. Your friends seem older, and worry fills your days. But all through the years, your open eyes and ears saw just enough of Christ among the people here to know who you could trust, to know that you were loved, until there came the day your heart could finally say, I want to go where you are going, Lord. I want to be among your people where you are. I cannot live my life alone. I don't know how. But you would not bring me this far to leave me now. When people come into church, do they see God? This idea, well, let me back up. I'm getting ahead of myself. If we go back up to Romans chapter 12, I picked this particular scripture reading for a very specific reason. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. The word that is translated as service is, and I am not a Greek specialist, so I know this won't be pronounced correctly. But the Greek word is latria. The definition that Strong's gives to this word is ministration of God. That is worship. Divine service. This word gives worship and service as synonymous. They're the same. Worship and service are the same. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 is a passage that we are quite familiar with, or most churchgoers are quite familiar with. Starting in verse 31, 
we have the judgment of the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as his shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord... When did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Worship equaling service. All of a sudden, this starts making sense. Service. What do we do? Now, it's easy to read this passage and say, okay, we ought to have all these things happening in our church. But in that passage, where did it talk about the Ten Commandments? Where did it talk about it's more important to keep Sabbath than Sunday? I'm not disagreeing with our doctrines, but what is important to God? Isn't it the people? If we collectively are a representation of God. What should be the most important thing to us? Shouldn't it be, as we imitate Christ, the people? So as you come to church today, what I am suggesting to you is that because you are here, you are not necessarily worshiping. Because you hear me talking, you are not necessarily worshiping. Because you gave some money, you are not necessarily worshiping. Because you sang a song, you are not necessarily worshiping. Because you heard the Bible read or you read the Bible yourself, you are not necessarily worshiping. Yes, you can worship in all of those items. But just because you do them does not mean that you're worshiping. There's another situation that Christ used as a teaching element for his disciples. You find it in Mark and Luke, the story of the widow in the two mites. Christ and his disciples have sat down in a place where they can see the offering chest in the temple. And they are watching as Pharisee and scribe and other people, very well dressed, very to do, walk over to this, take their bag and dump all of this money into this offering chest. And as they're watching this, 
All of a sudden, Christ spots this woman. And I can see him nudging the disciple next to him. Watch that woman. Hey, look at that woman. Watch what she does. Watch where she goes. And in my imagination, the woman is walking through almost as if she's headed somewhere else and just reaches over very indiscreetly, drops something into that and keeps right on going. And Christ turns to the disciples. Did you see that? Did you see what she just did? And knowing from scripture how wise the the disciples were, most of them probably said, what are you talking about? He said, all these other people gave out of their excess. She gave everything she had. All these other people came up and made a show, but didn't worship. She came up as indiscriminately as possible and worshiped her Lord and Savior. When you come into church and you look around, who is it that you see that's hungry? Who is it that you see that's thirsty? Who is naked? Who is a prisoner? Who is sick? Today, as you have come to church today, who do you see around you? And how can you use the gift of grace that God has given you to feed that person, to give them a drink, to clothe them, to visit with them, to encourage them, I would suggest any of those activities you will be worshiping because you can't do it if you're not. When you leave church, did you worship? That's a question for you. I can't answer it. Nobody else can answer it. And if your worship today is in the act of giving an offering, you worshiped. Don't let anybody ever take that away from you. If your act of worship today was just being here, you worshiped. But realize that the reason we're here, the reason we're together, is service. Service for the building up of our church, of God's church.